Good morning, welcome back. You are watching Daybreak and thank you for staying with us. The hashtag on X is Daybreak. The SMS code is 22422 at uh, Citizen TV Kenya and at IU Abdikadir. It's health and lifestyle. And with me in studio is Dr. Innocent Maranga, who is gynecological oncologist and will be focusing on reproductive organ cancers with a focus on ovarian cancer here in studio. On the 4th of February, every month of the year is World Cancer Day, and uh, we focus on that matter here on the broadcast with focus on the ovar ovar ovarian cancer. And recently, and of course, there were reports that the government had received about the rising cases of such cancers and the awareness that ought to be created and rolled out by the government agencies. Dr. Ali, thanks for your time. Uh, thank you. And good morning and uh, good to have you on the broadcast. First, um, what do we need to know about uh, um, ovarian cancer? Because that's where specification is and our focus this morning. And some of uh, the wish list that uh, any girl or woman would otherwise look out for. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ayub, for inviting me to this show. And uh, this is a very important aspect in terms of health, and uh, this having been the World Cancer uh, Day. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about ovarian cancer today and uh, uterine cancer. Now this seems to be somehow a bit, uh, we don't talk much about them, but we have quite a number of patients mm -hmm. in that particular regard. We've been mainly talking, at least in the media, so to speak, and most places I'm called to talk about is usually cervical mm -hmm. cancer. Uh, the other cancers which would generally be talked mostly about are breast cancer, people are aware about those, uh, prostate cancer and the like. So in terms of um, the uterine cancer and ovarian cancer, this we've not been talking much, at least in my understanding in the media. So it's important that you actually called us in to discuss about it. So very quickly, I will use this model if the camera could uh, zero in. Yeah. Uh, so that we, we are able to stay in context yes. in terms of what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, usually this is the cervix mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about the cervix because it causes, the, it's the, it causes a lot of cancers in this country. It's almost number one, number two yeah. in terms of uh, cancer. And now we are talking about the uterus yeah. or the, the womb, yeah. so to speak, carries the baby there. And then we are talking about the ovaries. Yeah. So the ovaries, both of them on the left and then on the other right. So these are the organs which we're going to talk about, yeah. uh, discussing about how does one um, suspect that they actually have uh, these particular types of cancers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And all right, from there on then, uh, mm -hmm. first, list for us and for our viewers, and we welcome their contributions as well, because there are some who might have questions. Yeah. The essential functions of ovaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, basically, it's uh, production of hormones. Production of hormones, estrogen and progesterone, these are basically the hormones of, uh, of, of which makes an individual a woman or yeah. a female, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, they would uh, control menstruation when one is at puberty until the time they reach uh, menopause. So that is the actual function. And of course, there's the ovulation bit of it. That's where the eggs come from. Uh, to make a human being during conception. So that's the main function, really, uh, broadly speaking, of uh, the ovaries. The uterus, on the other hand, since we're also talking about it, the womb is really, as the name implies, yeah. to carry the baby. Okay. And, and then uh, what are the signs to look out for in, in the case of ovarian cancer? I mean, at what point would someone suspect or feel like mm. that uh, indeed he, she has cancer? because mm. we are talking about the she question here. Yeah. And what are the symptoms, therefore, to look out for? Mm. In terms of uh, symptoms, they're not very specific, and that's the tragedy of it. Yeah. Uh, they're quite vague, they're non-specific, so women will feel just unwell. They have a bit of fatigue, they feel they're not having appetite, they, are not, they, they feel bloated, they have a lot of gas. Um, then as time goes by, they may start losing weight. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about, <clears throat> about ovarian cancer, and then may have uh, abdominal distension. They saw the, the abdomen starts uh, distending. And um, uh, there they could be others, but now when you cross over to, say, uh, uterine cancer, 
Um, they may have um, a discharge mm -hmm. from the private parts, which may be foul smelling. They may also have uh, bleeding, which is abnormal. So you find a lady has uh, periods, which have been very, very regular, 28 day cycle. Yeah. Then uh, suddenly it starts changing. Mm -hmm. uh, they start having intermenstrual bleeding, that is from one period to the next period, they're bleeding in between. Yeah. And um, or somebody or a lady has reached menopause, they have stopped seeing their periods for whatever duration, and then suddenly they start having periods. These are not periods. When one reaches menopause, it comes at variable uh, times. Yeah. There are those who develop as early as 45, there are those who develop as late as 55 years. Yeah. But once one sets into menopause, yeah. then the bleeding should stop. And while at it, I should also mention that. Um, any, any woman who sees such, and especially after menopause, mm -hmm. and there's even spotting, they should be able to go to their healthcare giver, go and see their doctor, go to the nearest clinic, so that they're actually checked why they are spotting. Usually that is the telltale sign that something is wrong in the reproductive organs. It may be cervical, which is more common, uh, but, most, uh, but other times it could be uterine yeah. from the womb, or it could be the ovaries which are overproducing some hormones and therefore causing one to start having periods. So those are, that's a very ominous sign. That's a bad sign, bleeding after menopause. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when we talk about that, and mm. does it entail, because you said from yeah. uh, period to period, yeah. which ordinarily is not the case, yeah. then that, does it involve oozing of blood? And if so, is it to the scale of what normally mm. any woman would uh, um, um, have during her periods, for example, the monthly periods that she, she's, she's ought to have. I mean, mm. how then do you distinguish both ends here of when she has the normal periods and when this, uh, she oozes blood, which is what you said could be um, the signs that she has uh, ovarian cancer, mm. and how do you differentiate here? Yeah, that's a pretty good question. Of course, uh, there's a rider to that in the sense that um, it depends on what one has been experiencing before, yeah. what their normal has, has been before. Uh, what I talked about is uh, after menopause, that any bleeding after menopause, after one a woman stops seeing periods, that bleeding is a bad sign. That's number one. Coming back to the context of your question, for those women who have not reached menopause, yeah. They're having regular periods, and that's where your question comes in. Mm -hmm. How do they differentiate? Mm -hmm. It depends how it has been. Maybe for, for, for a young lady, the periods have been irregular, not coming regularly, or they've been heavy. At that point, they should still have seen a doctor. But if there is a drastic change from what they have been experiencing, then they're having this irregular, prolonged bleeding, which is quite, uncom quite unusual to them, mm -hmm. to themselves. That and they should see a doctor. Now, still on the same, there are other confounding factors. Yeah. What this means is, um, depends also on what contraceptives, yeah. family planning methods mm -hmm. uh, somebody is using. For somebody who's using the pill, things like family plan, the daily pill, yeah. the periods tend to be quite regular, like a clock, most of the time. Mm -hmm. But there are those other contraceptives. Uh, like uh, Jadel, yeah. these are implants which are put on the arm. Yeah. I'm sure the, most women f viewers will understand. Uh, those ones, uh, and sometimes some types of coils, uh, which have hormones. So in other words, hormonal contraceptives, mm -hmm. apart from the pill. We have others which are injections, which a woman would usually get an injection once a month or twice, um, or once every two months or three months. Now those ones tend to interfere with their menstrual flow yeah. and their cycles. Yeah. So those ones are known to do that. Uh, but if there is anything or any worry around that, they should generally see a doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, different types of um, mm -hmm. cancers are attributed to different causes. Yeah. For example, um, heavy smoking, mm -hmm. alcoholism, um, environmental factors are attributed to certain types of cancers. What is the common cause here for mm. ovarian cancer mm. that uh, should be the point at which you say you should avoid A, B, C, and D mm. because they will lead to this type of cancer? Okay. So I'll talk generally about uh, those risk factors for ovarian cancer. Yeah. 
but also about uh, uterine cancer or those cancers because they're more or less uh, they're reproductive organ, uh, organ. So the risk factors are not very well understood. Yeah. It's not like, for example, when you talk about cervical cancer, mm -hmm. where we talk of a human papilloma virus as, as being the, the central cause for, say, cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. For the ovarian and uterine cancers, mm -hmm. those ones, they are associated factors. And uh, they are associated with those who tend to have fewer children or no children at all, mm -hmm. those who are diabetic, those who are hypertensive, those who have had irregular uh, periods or irregular ovulation. So somebody stays for very many months without getting a period and they're not on any particular contraceptive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, 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 and there's also a genetic aspect to it, which I think is important for our viewers that if one has relatives, first degree le relatives or second degree relatives, yes. who have had cancer of the uterus, who have had cancer of the breast, who have had cancer of the ovary, mm -hmm. then that puts you at a higher risk of actually uh, getting a similar cancer. Either there's a relationship, genetically speaking, mm -hmm. uh, between ovarian cancer, uh, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, yeah. and colorectal cancer, colon mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So th those are some of the risk factors which are there. The smoking, of course, comes in, uh, especially for ovarian cancer, not so much in terms of uh, uterine cancer. Yeah. There are also some other, th other factors which are protective, which have f been found to be protective for this, especially ovarian cancer. And this is if uh, somebody has many children, uh, has given birth many times, so that's what I mean, uh, has been breastfeeding or has had uh, tubal ligation. Tubal ligation is basically the permanent contraceptive where we tie the tubes. These have been found to have uh, a protective aspect and in also the use of, um, of pills, the family planning yeah. pills has been associated with low risk mm -hmm. of, of developing ovarian cancer. All right, and in terms of also still the categorization and the grouping in terms of the age is also one of the critical factors mm -hmm. that uh, also is susceptible. Yeah. Uh, what age group and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the types of the cancers. In this case then, who is at more risk? Um, basically, uh, women beyond the age of 50, yeah. those ones are at higher, higher risk uh, for both ovarian cancer and uh, uterine cancer. Uh, but uh, ovarian cancer can also uh, be present in younger girls and even uh, those in the, um, even below 10 years, uh, those between uh, 20, I mean 10 and 20 uh, younger age, age groups. But for the uterine cancer, those are cancers of the uterus or womb, those ones tend to be more towards uh, menopause and after menopause. Yeah, yeah, and and b because the, the the question of growth is also another key question here. And mm -hmm. do, do cysts in the ovary cause this type of cancer? In your view? Um, no, most of the time. But there's a caveat to that. Most cysts, almost more than ninety percent of the cysts, would usually be innocent, meaning that they. They they are present. They are there, but they are not causing any problem. Mm -hmm. And every and any other woman can actually develop those cysts <clears throat> uh, during their menstrual cycle. And uh, they uh, most of them they, 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 we call them functional cysts. Mm -hmm. So they are hormonal related, but they don't uh, become cancer. Yeah. They are basically. Uh, they, they, they come on the right, they come on the left side of the ovary, but they go on their own. But when one is reaching around the age of uh, 50, then it, they become more significant, okay. especially if uh, one is tested, they do maybe an ultrasound scan, some type of imaging, and then it is sizable. It's a big cyst. It's like nine, eight, ten centimeters. And then it is solid, in meaning inside it's solid. And that gives us a more suspicion that it could actually be cancerous. Mm -hmm. And there are also other things which we check in the blood. Yeah. We call them tumor markers, mm -hmm. uh, which would also point to a possibility of having uh, ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is it screened? And I mean, talking of, because that is uh, one of uh, 
the very first uh, process to um, treatment mm. and do we have the right tools and the technology mm. to do that? Mm -hmm. um, yes, we have. Um, in terms of availability in this country, it's there, yeah. like any other part of this country. But in terms of uh, specificity to diagnose ovarian cancer or uterine cancer, mm -hmm. we don't as yet have a very good tool mm -hmm. globally yeah. to speak. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back to cervical cancer because it's more understood. Uh, for cervical cancer, we usually say and tell our women to go to hospital to do a regular pap smear, yes. uh, checking on the cervix. But for ovarian cancer, there are so many things which have been tried in terms of screening the population. Mm -hmm. But we don't as yet have a very good tool in terms of screening the population. But in terms of one, when one, and, and, and that brings me to the point of why we have late presentation mm -hmm. of uh, patients who come to see us and they come in, in advanced disease. I'm talking specifically about ovarian cancer. They come to hospital when it is just really advanced. And 80%, by the time we see a patient who comes to us, 80% of them have an advanced disease mm -hmm. of the ovary. That means, advanced here means it has gone beyond the ovary, it's gone to the other surrounding organs and even to distant organs, that's what I mean. So coming back to your actual question yes. in terms of the tools, yes, we do have. An ultrasound scan would usually be a more basic type of test. Yes. That's to scan the abdomen, uh, see how the uterus is, see how the ovaries yes. are, how the reproductive organs are. That would generally be one of the first starting points mm -hmm. uh, and a general check. Yeah. yeah. And then if, if, if the suspicion yes. of um, probably a cancer there, then we would, um, of course, um, uh, take a biopsy. A biopsy means uh, representative tissue. Yeah. I'm talking about, about cancer in the uterus. Mm -hmm. A representative tissue from yes. the uterus, and then it's tested for, for confirmation. For ovarian cancer, we are not too fast yeah. to take a biopsy, unless, of course, it's obvious it's a spread uh, cancer, because you also don't want to, uh, for, for, for a cancer which is very confined on the cervix, to spill it off mm -hmm. inside the abdomen. So for those ones, we'll do other tests like CT scans, MRIs. Uh, nowadays, we have PET scan, but yes. it wouldn't come that early. So basically to give us a picture in terms of probability of having a cancer before we decide on the treatment. Mm -hmm. And if detected yeah. at an early stage, say, mm -hmm. yeah. what are the available options for treatment mm -hmm. of that respective patient? Yeah. Um, for an early disease, generally we go for surgery. So in other words, once we diagnose a cancer, we'll scan the whole body. Mm -hmm. That is part of... Um, uh, mapping out the disease, yeah. see whether it is confined to the reproductive organs or it has spread to other organs. And uh, then we, for early disease, we do surgery. And this type of surgery, most of the time, will remove both ovaries and will remove the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the cervix. So it's yeah. a more like an extensive type of, uh, of surgery. Of course, there are other details in terms of the actual surgeries mm -hmm. that we do. All right. Mm -hmm. And, and g given what we have uh, talked about in terms of, uh, and we'll be sampling the feedback from our viewers as well here, mm -hmm. because uh, of uh, the intensity with which, uh, and, and the learning aspect about how the further information that they would need, then what would inform the need, um, for example, to make the decision to altogether do away with the ovaries? Mm -hmm. You know, in... Um in any decision, yeah. usually we look at what are the benefits and what are the risks. Mm -hmm. And then we tend to individualize the treatment. For those women who are younger, uh, maybe they haven't reached menopause or they're below the age of um, 40, yeah. mm -hmm. and we diagnose the disease, depending on the type of cancer it is, if it's, utri if it's a ovarian, we may remove only that particular uh, ovary so that she remains with the uterus and also she remains with the other ovary and uh, so that she's able to get her children. Yeah. But that one is usually on the basis of how aggressive this particular type of cancer is. Because you wouldn't want to uh, 
uh, in, in some types of cancer. Let me elaborate on that. Yeah. We are talking generally about ovarian cancer mm -hmm. or uh, uter uterine cancer. Yeah. But then there are nitty gritties to that. Even ovarian cancer, it's not one entity. There are various types of ovarian cancers mm -hmm. which behave very differently. There are those which behave mildly, so they can allow us to treat, and, and, and we get them early, so they can allow us to treat by just removing one, one ovary and yeah. leaving the lady, if she's young, to get children. While there are others which are very aggressive, which unfortunately, however young a lady is, one is forced to actually do a total uh, surgery to remove all the, those reproductive organs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the event it's totally removed, yeah. uh, for hypothesis purposes, yeah. Can again, are there chances of that cancer recurring? Sure, it depends on uh, the stage of the disease. That brings me to the, uh, how, I mean, the other aspect of things we consider. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a very early stage cancer, um, most of the time we may or may not follow it up with the chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, these are injections which uh, would target, uh, which would ca target cancer cells. Uh, but having said that, there's always a risk of recurrence. Yeah. yeah. And then one of the common questions, um, how about, and what if that patient still intends to have children? Mm -hmm. What happens? Mm -hmm. um, these are usually very hard decisions to make and usually have it back and forth in terms of um, the type of surgery which needs to be done. And uh, to be honest, sometimes it's a matter of life and death. That's the fact of it, yeah. where the rubber meets the tarmac. So it is a decision which, hard decisions which have to be made yeah. by family, by couples, by the patient, in terms of um, uh, the, surgery, the type of surgery to be done. Of course, as surgeons, we are cognizant of all those factors. We usually would, um, if there is time and we are able to, depending on the stage of the disease, sometimes we may harvest eggs from probably the, the, the ovary, which is um, uh, normal. Uh, but that should not be at the expense of spread because harvesting eggs, stimulating the eggs in order to harvest so that you can preserve them for future fertility, uh, that means more time and more time sometimes may mean spread of the disease. Yeah. Yeah. And then another common uh, question attached to that report is that uh, mm. same length is, can it endometriosis cause ovarian cancer? It is associated. It's not really the cause, yeah. but it is associated. As I said, we really don't have um, uh, an actual, something which you can pin and say, actually, this is the cause not like cervical cancer, say human papilloma virus is the cause. Yeah. So endometriosis has been found to be related, to be associated with the high uh, occurrence of ovarian cancer. Yeah. And here I'm talking about the question of um, expounding more on the information that, that is required and here. And then what, what are the best preventable ways that uh, one can embark on to prevent ovarian cancer? Because the others as well, if you look at the different types of uh, the cancers, there are preventable ways if advised by a medical practitioner and you do avoid and you do what's required of you, uh, there are higher chances of you not getting that, types of, that type of a cancer mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. What are the, the preventable ways that mm -hmm. one can adopt? Okay. Now for this one, it, uh, it doesn't have a straight answer yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will, I'll talk generally about avoidance of uh, protecting ourselves yeah. against yeah. cancer generally. And those do, uh, do apply to uterine cancers and ovarian cancers. Yeah. And those are lifestyle, basically lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And for lifestyle here, we mean uh, <clears throat> what we eat, we are looking at uh, diet, uh, how do we do we exercise or not? How active are we in our lives? Are we having sedentary life? Uh, and are we exercising as yes. uh, such like? So you find that there are those diets, especially uh, 
talking from a traditional African uh, point of view. Previously, even statistics used to show that Africa and Africans used to have very low figures mm -hmm. in terms of cancer, but we are catching up with the West, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is due to our indulgence with fast foods that are all over the place. I don't want to mention names. Uh, and, 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 and basically fried foods, the way we prepare foods, the, uh, the pollution of what we eat, even when we are eating um, uh, those traditional foods, but where have they been grown? Have they been grown on a sewage area and such like areas? Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the way to prevent ovarian or uterine cancer is the same as any preventing those other cancers, mm -hmm. and that comes to lifestyle change. So we don't have a tool, as I said initially, yeah. uh, for, for screening. But having said that, it's really change of our attitude as a people in terms of um, uh, our awareness of how our bodies function, mm -hmm. our awareness of ourselves, because you are the best doctor for your body, mm -hmm. because you detect, you know your body best, and you can detect any of those uh, symptoms which are abnormal, and then you go to your doctor as soon as uh, possible. So in terms of the protection, it's, all, it's basically just healthy living in terms of what we eat, how we interact. Yeah. Uh, there's, of course, uh, sexual health and all that. Yeah. Yeah. How, how important is uh, early screening here? And uh, how can the culture of that be promoted among mm -hmm. girls and women as well to mm -hmm. prevent cases that ought to have been staved off otherwise mm -hmm. and keep at bay cases of men, many cases of ovarian cancer? Mm. As I mentioned earlier, we don't have uh, <clears throat> a particular type of uh, screening method. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that one goes to see their doctors or goes to the nearest clinic, yeah. at least um, more so often, at least for annual checkup, mm -hmm. that would uh, help one to have it uh, detected earlier. Or when one sees any type of symptom as we have just talked. Mm -hmm. yeah. And l let's also now expound a bit more on uh, what's also interlinked with that, which is uh, the uterine uh, cancer. Yeah. And here, I mean, if you look at uh, um, it, more or less intertwined and, and, mm. and, and at, of course, uh, borders on what we have talked about. Are the, are the causes the same generally? And mm. uh, in terms of the symptoms, are they the same? In terms of uh, the uh, preventable ways of what not to do, it, does it still mean that you adopt the same mechanisms and strategy? I mean, and in what way are they related mm -hmm. when you talk about ovarian cancer and uterine cancer? Um, they're, they're related very closely, even when you talk about um, the risk factors, which we have just talked about. And actually, earlier I was talking about both of them, uterine and, uh, and, and ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the main difference is um, for uterine cancer, it, it tends to present a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm as compared to ovarian cancer. So the uterine cancer, because it, it tends to present more with the very early, with the uh, bleeding, yeah. abnormal bleeding, mm -hmm. uh, which you said if a lady has reached menopause, then uh, postmenopausal bleeding, that's the commonest mm -hmm. uh, sign, uh, which would usually be a very, very early sign that uh, things are not well there. And if a woman would go for for checkup at that particular point, then they're likely to be yeah. diagnosed with a very early disease mm -hmm. and stands a very high chance of cure. Yeah. 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 And, and when you talk about this, <clears throat> what happens then? Oh, and is there a chance that a patient can have all the two types of cancers that we have talked about here? And uh, talking about treatment, then what are the chances in terms of that person undergoing medical attention and getting the required treatment of the both cancers now? Mm -hmm. It's, it's rare to have uh, uterine cancer and ovarian cancer at the same time. Uh, what we tend to see more is uh, you have um, one cancer, that ovarian cancer, spreading to the uterus and vice versa. So you find that because of the close proximity mm -hmm. and uh, they, are, they are there together. So in those particular, and that is why I said that we tend to remove both the ovary and the uterus, irrespective of where they cancer started from because they're interrelated and they spread to each other yeah so in terms of um, 
uh, the treatment, yeah. as I said, most of the time, if it is early, yeah. we would start with the, with the surgery to remove those organs. Mm -hmm. And then after surgery, or around that time with the imaging, we're able to do the staging. Yeah. And then we are able to know the actual type of cancer. Then based on that, yeah. we are able to prescribe if, if one needs chemotherapy mm -hmm. or radiation therapy. Yeah. 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 Which are both uh, <coughs> treatment mechanism ways. Then, I mean, most of the concern uh, then shifts to the side effects and the consequences of this treatment. Mm. What are they? Can you enumerate on the same? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> For the... Uh, first, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, part of the modalities which uh, we usually use is surgery, but the other modalities are chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where your question comes yeah. in. Uh, chemotherapy has its own side effects, and I'm sure you've had many speakers come here talk yeah. about uh, side effects of chemotherapy. But in brief, they may cause uh, hair loss. That's one of the commonest, mm -hmm. and uh, it does distress some ladies, most ladies actually, when they are yeah. on chemo. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and um, the others would be like nausea, they feel like vomiting, they have low appetite, uh, they feel fatigue. Uh, they have tingling sensation or uh, the sensa numbness of the, the fingers yeah. and the toes. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time these are transient, mm -hmm. transient uh, symptoms. The hair loss will usually grow back after a completion of the treatment. Mm -hmm. Of course, on treatment, we usually do a close follow-up. So we check on how the kidneys are functioning, how the liver is functioning, how the bone marrow is functioning, the blood level and the like. So these are usually to detect any side effects which may occur uh, during the time of uh, chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, going now to the radiotherapy. Yeah. Radiotherapy, uh, usually we hardly use radiotherapy for ovarian cancers, mm -hmm. but we do use it often for uterine cancers. And uh, for this one, we, some of the side effects would be, they're much, much less than chemo, mm -hmm. but they would tend to be um, maybe a bit of frequency of urination, some discomfort on passing urine, or discomfort on passing stools, or having diarrhea, or uh, basically just fatigue, or having some skin rashes uh, as the radiation is yeah. being done. And we'll get some questions from our yeah. viewers shortly here. One final question, Dr. Tari. Then we are moving into a new system in terms of our healthcare and uh, um, talking of uh, the Social Health Insurance Fund and uh, the Chronic Illnesses Fund and the SHIF, is it a step in the right direction in terms of when someone exhausts his medical cover, this being the last landing spot for people with chronic illnesses like cancers that we have just talked about? Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> on, on, in, in terms of um, the changes which are ongoing, uh, I wouldn't want to comment too much because uh, they haven't been, at least on the ground, in terms of the implementation. Uh, what we are doing at the moment, at least uh, in practice, we are still using the NHIF uh, in terms of uh, cancer treatment, for chemotherapy, for surgery, and also for radiotherapy. Now, if you look, but I believe we are going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us who have been in the field for some time, we do remember that um, cancer treatment was way bad in terms of um, the facilities which were available, the type of personnel which were available, the infrastructure generally which was available during that time. Yeah. And uh, there's a time when we were training when the only center was Kenyatta National Hospital. Mm -hmm. When the machine could break down, we could send our patients across the border to Mulago in Uganda. That has since changed and a lot has been done and I think that has been in the right direction. Uh, we currently have uh, many, at least three comprehensive cancer centers mm -hmm. in this country, uh, at least outside Nairobi. We are talking about Garissa, Mombasa, and Nakuru. Yes. We do have uh, the referral hospitals, Moi referral, Moi teaching a referral hospital. Uh, there's the KU hospital, K -T -T K -U -T -R -R -H. And there's, of course, uh, Kenyatta mm. National Hospital. Yeah. And these are uh, largely better equipped today than they were many years ago. And uh, we do have uh, uh, 
cyber knife, so to speak, mm -hmm. within the country. We have pet scans, which are within the country, yeah. which never used to be there before, and we used to send them, yeah. most of our patients to India. And uh, a lot of trainings have also occurred. So in terms of uh, progress in this country, in cancer treatment, a lot has happened. There's still a lot to be done because uh, cancer, as you know, impoverishes uh, families. Thank you. Let, let's run through the uh, feedback and, and we close. Um, here's what we are saying. The hashtag on X is daybreak. The SMS code is 22422 at uh, Citizen TV Kenya and at IU Abdikadir. The first one here coming from uh, Hi, uh, I mean, no, no name here. Hi, on my case, I have been experiencing discharge, which is in white color. When I go to hospital, the doctor usually says it's unbalanced hormone. My question is, what exactly am I suffering from, Dr. Uh, good question there. Um, talking about, when you talk about uh, discharge, uh, one can have a normal discharge. It's basically the secretions. It's normal to have uh, secretions, which sometimes can change color, uh, depending on the yes. type on this time of cycle, mm -hmm. uh, so in absence of infection and in absence of other uh, diseases or other conditions, mm -hmm. most often it's due to hormonal changes. Mm -hmm. So for this particular lady, I believe you've done um, an ultrasound scan yes. with your doctor and you've done a pap smear with your doctor. In absence of all that, then that should be the case. Yeah. Um, the second, and we are out of time. Hi, I'm Lillian from Saika. I'm 22 years old, of, uh, okay, age. I have been getting irregular periods since my puberty, but since I gave birth on in December, I have been bleeding for three weeks, non-stop, which abdominal pains and backaches. Should I be worried as we close? Um, yeah, you should be concerned. Should be concerned. It may not be cancer as such. We are talking about cancer, but this is not necessarily cancer. It could be related to the delivery which you had in December, yes. you need to see your doctor, have a thorough checkup to confirm why you're actually bleeding, whether there's yeah. anything which may have remained behind. Thank you. Dr. Mm. Ari, yeah. um, we are out of time and we thank you. can only sample those two. And we thank our viewers for sending in the questions. And uh, Dr. Innocent Maranga is gynecological oncologist. And uh, we were here talking about health matters on health and lifestyle. Thanks for waking up with us here on the broadcast since 6 a.m. We, of course, appreciate your feedback here on the broadcast. The hashtag on X has been daybreak. The SMS code 22422 at Citizen TV Kenya and at IU. Abdikadir. We'll see you on Friday here on daybreak. Till then. Good morning.